Hi, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Alabama. This is the first state level forecast I'm doing inside the southeastern region, which if you've checked out that regional forecast, you know we're facing a particularly challenging regional outlook. I don't want to sugarcoat things for you. Everything we're going to talk about here, I'm going to do my best to be realistic, to look at the hard parts head on and in historical context. There are challenges here and there are ways to face those challenges. We're going to look at some projections for 2050 around nighttime temperature, and I'm going to tell you why that's an important part of the story. We'll talk about precipitation. We'll talk about projected agricultural zone changes. We'll check in on the Gulf Coast, look at what's going to happen with sea level rise there. And then after we put all those pieces together, we'll look at how these changes will impact human life, health and our working lives. First, let's check out the historical data. Let's check out what's been happening with temperatures in the South. Just a second. So you have a lot of people in the Southeast, you have a lot of people in Alabama who aren't concerned about global warming. And this graph here can tell you why people in this area wouldn't be concerned about global warming. Check it out, percent change. You've been looking at like 80% fewer hot days in the state, right? You had fewer hot days since the 50s, fewer days over 95 degrees. It's easy to see when that's your experience, why you wouldn't be concerned about global warming. And it's an interesting fact that the heat, the changes aren't coming in daytime temperatures to this region. They're coming in the night. Let's scroll down here. Historical data, 1950 to 2016, we've had in most parts of Alabama, 100% increase in warm nights. You might be thinking, I'm asleep then. What do I care? I've got air conditioning. And if you have air conditioning, you probably don't have an impact on your health from these warm nights. If you're trying to sleep without air conditioning, being unable to get your core body temperature cooled down can have an impact on your health over time, especially if you work outside like a utility worker in, in the South, it's gonna have serious health impacts. But you know, even more than the health impacts, I think it's important to consider what these warm nights do to our agricultural potential in Alabama. Some commercially important crops, such as corn and soy, they do a lot of their grain fill, their pod fill at night after the temperatures get below about 85, and they don't have great fill above 85. So these warm nights, they're serious when you think about your agricultural production, and that's a lot of the wealth and the strength of the state right now. So looking at agricultural innovation, looking at crops that can tolerate these warm nights is gonna be an important potential opportunity. And this is just historical trends. Let's take a second, let's look at the projected data for those warm nights. Just one second, I'm gonna switch over to the right page. This map here, if you check it out in the report, we can look at 2100 too, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about 2050 where the low, and the high scenarios, low and high emission scenarios, really lead to pretty similar futures. We'll peek down at the key here, but we're talking about up to 50 more warm nights a year in Alabama. And we'll notice this is an unfortunately located hot spot in these pretty close together low and high emission futures for Alabama. It looks like it's pretty much right over Montgomery, which means that you're gonna have some fairly serious needs for infrastructure upgrades to keep the air conditioning on, to keep the people in this city able to be cool at night and able to be healthy. And these are significant agricultural areas here that are in this warm island. Even in the lower scenario, there's that warm island there. So that need for agricultural innovation is very serious for the future well-being of the state. And speaking about agricultural conditions, I want to talk for a second about precipitation. And this is an area where the South has seen lots of changes. It feels like it's much too often we hear those horrible stories about people drowning in these deluges of rain. And look here, we can look at historical changes in heavy precipitation in Alabama, days where there's been more than three inches of rain. We see a lot of these red dots, right? We see a lot of these uh, 40, 60, 80% dots in Alabama. We don't have scientists consensus, a great way 
to predict what the weather is going to be in like June of 2048, right? But the general agreement is quite strong that this trend historically is going to continue. So if you're in a part of Alabama right now that's had more intense precipitation, especially down here by the Gulf Coast, you should expect that trend to continue. And we're going to need to think about that both in terms of urban solutions around drainage and in terms of agricultural solutions. You know, if anyone who cares about plants, we know that these very intense precipitation events are, are challenging, whether you're talking about a conventional crop or more of like a plant community, a garden community. The increased temperatures, they're gonna push you in Alabama up almost an agricultural zone by 2050. It's not a huge shift, but it's notable. So the way we farm and garden would have to change in Alabama, not just because of that increase in agricultural zone, but because we might wanna choose different species that can tolerate really high levels of water stress. There's gonna be substantial advantages for plants of all kinds that can tolerate this high water stress. Now, speaking of water and trying to manage water stress, let's go look down at the Gulf Coast. Just a second while I shift over to another website. Here we go. So this is the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer. If you've uh, watched this channel before, you've seen that it provides coverage showing impact on the coast of sea level rise all across the US. And this is the current coast uh, area in Alabama. Unfortunately, the Gulf Coast is going to see higher levels of uh, seawater incursion than other parts of the coast. We're talking about two feet, maybe three feet by 2050. And I wanna show you what that's gonna look like. We've got substantial bayou areas where we know this coast we're looking at isn't exactly ground you're gonna build a house on, right? It's marshy, it's a bayou, and it's been left as it is to allow for uh, protection against storm surge. But just the sea level rise of a foot Look how far inland you're gonna have more water. You're gonna have dramatic change in what the landscape is gonna look at. And we get up to two feet, maybe three feet. That water is gonna be on a daily basis, far up into the state. You're gonna be looking at a different kind of coastline in Alabama. And this doesn't account for storm surge. So you can see, zoom in here, Mobile Alabama, a lot of the infrastructure is going to be impacted. There's going to be a need for resilience, maybe for some seawall creation, maybe for some moving of infrastructure. It's a real challenge and a real opportunity looking at ways to get on top of this and make the city, which is such an important port, more resilient. So important for our energy industry. Like in the Texas forecast, it's a serious national problem that we should all care about, all want to help, all be concerned about when we look at the Gulf Coast ports. And when we look at this changing shoreline, this is an area where you really wonder about potential positive changes for recreation. There might be some opportunities here. If you live in Alabama and you're curious about this, come check out coast.noaa.gov you're gonna be able to zoom in really close. You can get down almost to a house level and see what's gonna happen and where this shoreline is projected to go. And remember, this just shows sea level rise. It doesn't show where it could go with a storm surge. You can imagine all of us who have been in the Gulf during some of those serious hurricanes that were looking at a storm surge that could go well outside of this area. Imagine if you get a hurricane coming up from the Gulf, running right up that river. It's serious. It's worth thinking about how to protect all of the people who live in this area and what kind of infrastructure needs we're gonna to have to have to protect our energy industry. I'll stop going on about that though. It's nice to have a concept of where the coastline's gonna shift. Cause you know, this area, it's always been beautiful and it's always been challenging the Gulf Coast. I feel like, by Louisiana and Alabama, all of us who love that part of the country, we accept that it's dynamic, the coastline changes, that area really belongs to the sea, and we just get to use it for a while. 
you know, I think we can look at these changes, we can look ahead, but we don't need to freak out about them. Like people maybe ought to be doing in New York where we're seeing potential intrusion of the ocean waters into areas where no one might've expected. This area, you know, that might be kind of a shocking map to see, but when you let it sink in, it's not such a big surprise. And I think we're gonna be able to find ways to enjoy these areas well into the future. And thinking about that, that enjoyment, I think is an important opportunity. And speaking about that sort of quality of life issue, I do wanna show you there are some health concerns that should be highlighted for Alabama related to tropical disease. So let's go back over to the other figure. Just a second. We're looking at a possibility of new types of mosquitoes coming into the area. They're called Aedes aegypti. You may have already seen some of them. I've seen Aedes aegypti as far north as central Iowa, where hopefully we're gonna be able to stay cold enough they don't establish a beachhead. If you've seen a big mosquito, black with pronounced white stripes, that's Aedes aegypti. You can see that in the Gulf Coast, if there's a very high probability that it's gonna establish a permanent population, carries horrible tropical diseases that we are not used to treating in the US. As we think about the water infrastructure, the change to the sea level rise, the change to these heavy precipitation events, it's worth thinking about decreasing mosquito habitat because this is a problem where if we can think about it, prepare to stop this species from continuing to invade the US, we can minimize the damage. It's a threat that we could get worse or we could work to stop it now. In our working lives, the changes in precipitation, particularly humid precipitation heat, those indicate we're gonna likely lose a substantial amount of working hours in the South. And Alabama is one of the states that's hardest hit. Let's take a look at this map here, 789. When it's too hot outside, you can't work outside. You can't do agricultural work outside unless you're in an air conditioned vehicle and you can't do utility work, which when it's a heat wave, you really, you gotta care about those utility workers. By, this is for closer to the end of the century, 2090, you could be looking at pretty dang close to a 5% loss in working hours in much of the state. You should expect that to be closer to three by 2050. And this is an interesting map to look at, you know, this projected change in working hours. There's a lot of kind of hysterical, scared reactions to this in the scientific community, but it seems to me like there's cultural tools to not work in the hottest parts of the day. There might be a need to shift more essential work into the night, take a different pace to the day. You know, that's how people have handled hot, humid environments for centuries and the way they still do in some Latin American countries and Mediterranean countries. There's gonna need to be changes in how we live as Alabama becomes more tropical, but they don't have to be bad changes. The way we change the patterns of our lives, it can add to the quality of our lives. The countries that practice siesta, all reports say they really like it. It might be a way to consider shifting our American culture and practices in some states as we look to a more tropical future, a future that's gonna look and feel different, but we can find ways to make narratives where those changes aren't all bad. Let's wrap it up. This forecast is rough, but when I say it's rough, I'm not saying it's not manageable. As Alabama becomes an increasingly tropical state, there's gonna be a need to develop more tropical appropriate infrastructure an infrastructure that can handle the drainage needs of extreme storms. And probably we need to develop a more tropical working culture. Let's get serious here. We read alarming news and we can react in a panic key way. We can react in an anxious way. We can reject the news or we can look at it in context. Alabama is a state that has historical heat, humidity and some historical challenges with tropical disease. This is a state where the transition towards tropical isn't a huge abrupt transition. It's not like you're in Nebraska and now you're gonna grow palm trees on your porch. This is a state where if we see where the science says we're likely to go, we can get there. There are some places we've identified today that are particularly vulnerable. And there are some places where we'll need to build some more resiliency. And that building, that right there is our challenge and it's our opportunity. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe. Help get the message out there.
There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.